Okay, so my name is uh, Hedler Zeek, uh, Ricky Lache, uh, and this is my talk, Micro Hard, more like Micro Easy, pause for laughter, and off to a great start. Okay, so uh, yeah, first off, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm a principal security researcher at Keysight Technologies, I'm based out of Austin, Texas. Um, I focus mainly on offensive IoT research, um, and I've been doing this kind of stuff professionally since uh, 2009, and I speak at conferences fairly regularly. I've spoken at DEF CON like five times on, on the actual stages, and this is my first time speaking at IoT Village. Um, and then I have several hobbies. Uh, most of them involve me drinking whiskey. Uh, okay. So that's who I am. Uh, let's talk about who MicroHard is. Um, they're a Canadian-based device uh, manufacturer. Uh, they make basically uh, cellular bridges for uh, Ethernet and serial devices. Um, they're used in lots of uh, different environments that people uh, really care about, uh, such as like you know power utilities. Uh, I see unmanned vehicles listed on their <laughs> list of industries. Um, you know, just bas basically everywhere you could possibly think of needing to remotely access a device, uh, they're, they claim to be involved in some way. Okay, so uh, that's MicroHard as a company. Uh, let's talk about the device that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, it's called a Bullet LTE-NA2, NA is for North America. Um, so yeah, this is an LTE bridge for adding cellular connectivity to serial and uh, Ethernet devices. Um, and, you know, it's meant for managing uh, installations remotely. Um, this is a quote from their website. Uh, connect any device, old and new, serial or Ethernet, and provide cellular remote access using the bullet LTE-NA2. You know, what, what could possibly go wrong? Um, so I actually got this device because I was doing a security audit um, for a uh, utility company and they were wanting to deploy a bunch of different devices and wanted us to check the security of the devices and this was one of them and I did not end up recommending that they, <laughs> they deploy this uh, in the field um, and you'll see why. Okay, so uh, first off, uh, from a hardware perspective, um, it's a 32-bit ARM Cortex-A5 processor, um, which you can see in the top view. This is kind of like a, you know, the top of the board and the bottom of the board uh, kind of picture. Um, it's got uh, down, down in the bottom of the top view next to that uh, orangish yellowish thing is uh, expansion uh, flash firmware chip. Uh, 128 megs. The entire file system is read-write, which is pretty awesome. Um, and then it's also got 256 megs of RAM. And then on the underside of the board, they've got this Quectel modem, um, an EC25-AF. And then they've also got connections for a, uh, a SIM card slot, a PoE, Ethernet, a USB, and serial, um, in addition to a couple of programmable I.O. ports. And then uh, from the firmware perspective, um, the firmware updates are completely unsigned and unencrypted, um, so you can pretty easily uh, forge your own if you wanted to. Um, and they were also easy to extract with Binwalk. Um, the, inside the firmware updates, it's got the, the bootloader, um, it's got the Linux kernel, and it's got a full SquashFS file system. Um, so basically you could uh, fully uh, emulate the system if you are so inclined um, pretty easily. And then uh, the software itself, the OS is based uh, loosely on OpenWRT, uh, running a Linux 3.6.9 kernel. Um, in the version that I'm going to be demonstrating today, um, they were using uh, UHTTPD. Uh, for web, they changed to that in a subsequent version, and you'll see why they <laughs> why they decided to change it. Um, and then, yeah, they use Dropbear for SSH and Telnet D for Telnet, kind of. 
Um, they actually have, uh, whenever you log in when, with one of those services, uh, they end up dropping you into like a, a jailed debug environment, um, which we'll talk about extensively uh, later on. And then on the UDP side, uh, they've got a discovery service that basically, um, depending on the type of device you're using, will send out a discovery probe or will answer a discovery probe on one of these th three ports and give you a lot of information back. So it wouldn't be one of my talks if I didn't uh, discuss a discovery protocol because I love discovery protocols. So on this one, like I said, it sends uh, or it listens for broadcast UDP messages. Uh, port 2077 or two, 2077 is for uh, 3G devices, 87 is for IP based devices, and 97 is for LTE devices. So this one would respond uh, to broadcast messages it gets on port 20,097. Uh, the magic probe is the same across the board. And let's look at what that looks like. Um, so you can see um, this is a scanner that I wrote um, where I just like send out that broadcast packet to each one of those three ports and then I listen for responses. And so this is what the response looks like on the wire. Um, one kind of annoying thing um, is they um, will respond to you from a random port on their side to your source port but on the broadcast address which makes it really hard to correlate um, responses that you get. Okay, so the discovery uh, response contains a lot of useful info. Uh, it's got the MAC address and the IP address. Um, it's also got the host name and the SSID um, for any kind of wireless uh, stuff. Um, and then it has the model name and the firmware version. Uh, and then it's got this thing called NMS um, that's the network management software. It's like their cloud-based um, thing where you can register all of your devices and track the GPS location of all of them. Um, it's got the domain and password hash, but I'm not going to be talking about NMS today because um, that's not part of this talk. Um, okay, so and, and yeah, I wrote a, a scanner and response parser and I'll put it up on my GitHub which I'll link to later. Okay, so uh, let's, let's actually get into the bones. Uh, so the web management portal, this was kind of the main focus of my audit when I was originally looking at these devices. Um, like I mentioned earlier, it's UHTTPD uh, based on the version from OpenWRT in 2014. Um, it's used for configuring basically every aspect of the device um, and it is also reachable from LAN and WAN side um, and that's enabled by default and you have to actually turn that off um, if you don't want it reachable from the WAN side. Um, but the best part is it's all shell scripts. So like this is, this is the directory listing. Um, and it's literally like every single page is a shell script wrapped with a GUI. Um, so, you know, of course, uh, there are multiple command injections throughout this thing. Um, they're all, all uh, post auth, so you need a valid user account in order to access these pages. Um, so, yeah, multiple command injections. Uh, my example that I'm showing today uh, is with the diagnostics page. Um, because, of course, it implements ping um, and if it has ping, it has command injection every single time. Um, <laughs> oh my god, is that really my time warning? Okay, I have to, I have to really book it. Okay, um, so, so yeah, it has ping. So they tried to sanitize input but it failed pretty horribly. Um, they just sanitized the host name, didn't worry about any of the other arguments that you put in there. Um, so yeah, just leave host name blank and then put whatever command you want um, all in the count parameter. Uh, and let's show a demo of that real quick. Okay, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into uh, 
lots of the uh, details <laughs> of the exploits because I'm about to run out of time already. Uh, but yeah, so this is this is uh, post auth. So uh, you need a, a valid username and password. But then you run that, and eventually you will. Hey, you got a root shell um, because you injected a you know, whatever command you wanted to run and it has netcat on it, so I was able to get a root shell pretty easily with that one. Okay. We're gonna, we're gonna hurry up. Okay, so yeah, like I said, those, those um, volumes were all post auth, um, but I really wanted something that was pre auth um, because that's so much sexier. Um, so I started looking at the authentication uh, the way they handled authentication. Um, and as far as logging in, um, it was vanilla open WRT. They used um, basic auth. Um, so basically a base64 encoded user colon pass. Um, and, and so since this is, you know, UHTTPD that's part of open WRT, you'd think it would be very uh, well vetted and everything, but it is an open source project, so they were able to make their own modifications. Um, and so logins were generic, logouts um, was where they made a mistake. Um, basically, they wanted to set the basic auth header to logout colon logout. Um, and then they did like a stir copy of that buffer to a statically sized uh, buffer. Um, and then they could compare <laughs> what it was to log out, log out, and, and you know, log the person out that way. Um, but yeah, they didn't do any bounds checking or anything. Um, so, so yeah, you can see, I'm just going to skip past this because I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can see, uh, you know, uh, stir copy, uh, and, and yeah, yeah. Okay, let's do another demo. I am actually going to talk about the code of this one because it was very, uh, it was a very pat myself on the back kind of thing. This was my, my first ever in the wild arm ROP exploit. Um, so basically, um, yeah, so, so they do have DEP and ASLR and I wasn't able to find like a, a um, uh, memory leak or anything to, to leak the base address of libc um, or uc libc. Um, so I, um, for the purposes of this demo, I disabled ASLR, but it is the lame version of ASLR where they only randomize the, the top part. Um, so in theory, you could brute force um, by just like picking picking an address for the base of UC libc and then just trying over and over again and it'll just crash the website if it doesn't work and if it, you know, if it eventually works then you get a shell. Um, but yeah, so, so basically just, uh, you know, call, calling a system uh, from UC libc and passing uh, this, this command as the argument to UC libc and this one, hey, that was really fast. So yeah, no authentication required for that one because it's it's exploiting the authentication protocol. So there's that one. And okay. Okay, so I disclosed those back at back at the um, when I was doing the audit originally. Um, they fixed it in uh, R one 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 two by adding more uh, sanitization, um, and then they switched from using UHTTPD to using Light TPD. Um, so they no longer use UHTTPD, um, but it's still all shell scripts. Um, so, so yeah, it, um, that was the end of the audit and um, I kind of stopped thinking about the device. This release note still burns me to this day though because that was the extent of the release note that they used for fixing all of my critical vulnerabilities is miscellaneous housekeeping tasks that really, really bugged me. <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, cut to like a few months ago, I decided to dig this device back out and look at it again. And this time around, I was looking at the Telnet portal. Um, so like I mentioned before, um, it's uh, a jailed environment, but they give you lots of access to like uh, QT commands for that Quectel modem, or not QT, uh, AT commands for the Quectel modem. Um, so yeah, you can see they give you lots of commands. Um, and that's handled by slash bin slash CLI test. Um, that's spawned every time you log in as the admin user. Um, and that defines all of the AT commands, but uh, not all of the AT commands were, <laughs> were documented. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, there was an undocumented command called ATM bash command um, that lets you run two bash commands, uh, PS and cat. Uh, and that's it, supposedly. Um, but the way they verified that is by using uh, stir, stir in case compare and they were using the length of uh, what they were comparing from either PS or CAT. So as long as the string like began with PS or CAT, uh, then you could put whatever you wanted at the end of it. Um, so, so basically, uh, yeah, you just do like PS semicolon and then another command and there, there you go. Okay, one last demo, and then, and then uh, I'm, I'm basically done. Okay, so again, post auth. Hooray, there you go. Okay, so let's just blast through these last couple of slides to wrap up. Um, okay, so that one was actually coincidentally fixed like the month before I found it, um, which was also kind of annoying. Um, but the fix, like, I mean, it was, it was basically just in, in bash command, they removed that one and didn't touch anything else. And may have also added in some brand new command injection forms in that latest firmware. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you can see where they were trying to, to secure things and then they just failed miserably every single time. Um, they need actual like, you know, secure development processes. Um, and also I, I get really pissed off about the vague release notes because in my opinion it like minimizes the impact. If I saw something that just said, min you know, miscellaneous housekeeping tasks and I'm running in a um, critical environment, I'm going to completely ignore that update uh, because it seems like it's something I don't have to install and so it's just leaving me still vulnerable. Um, but yeah, and then if it has command, if it has ping, it has command injection. And that's uh, how you get in touch with me. I'm Headless Eek on most things. Um, that's my GitHub. Um, and yeah, that is it. Sorry if I went over time. That's it.